Uh, critical thinking and problem solvings. We're going to look at section 1 1 thinking mathematically. Uh, just kind of uh, kind of refresh our memory on some of the things that we already do. Uh, problem 1 2, we're going to get a little bit more familiar with a, a specific uh, process for problem solving and some different techniques. Uh, and then we'll look at some estimating and evaluating. We have some objectives here. Uh, we'll look at understanding mathematical reasoning. Uh, deductive and inductive reasoning today uh, and sequences so that's what we're looking at uh, in in uh, the first section would be these three uh, this would be 1.2 here um, uh, 1.2 also for applying problem-solving strategies and then 1.3 for estimates so as we look at 1.1 uh, thinking mathematically we have a brief introduction that I thought I'd share. This is uh, just from our ebook uh, online. Uh, mathematical thinking is important for decisions we all make every day. Moreover, possessing the ability to think mathematically makes one a better problem solver for all occasions. Consider the idea that a product of two odd numbers will always be odd. So product in math means multiply. If we multiply two odd numbers, the product will always be odd. Is this true? Take a moment to consider this. It is, in fact, always true. Although you may not spend time thinking of mathematical facts like this every day, everyone needs to have an understanding of mathematics in order to make reasonable, or sorry, responsible decisions each day. For example, you need to have an understanding of addition and subtraction with numbers and their attributes in order uh, to maintain a checking account. So the first type of reasoning we're going to talk about today is inductive reasoning. Uh, when you see these blue type of uh, kind of boxes with some bold uh, words in there, these are our definitions. These are things that you should probably take some notes on. But just as an introduction, it says doing math is a process that is far more than just calculations. It involves observing patterns, testing conjectures, and estimating in order to arrive at an answer that best fits the information given. To that end, the ideas of mathematical argument require us to uh, exercise the use of the ideas of inductive reasoning. Now, as you write this down, think about it. It says, inductive reasoning is a line of reasoning that arrives at a general conclusion based on the observation of specific examples. And I'll under that line that idea of specific examples. Inductive reasoning can be considered a generalization. Uh, in lay terms, uh, the way I talk about inductive reasoning is I kind of talk about it as taking observations. Anytime we observe something, anytime we look at observations or state observations and then make a rule, we are doing inductive reasoning. All right, we're going from um, specific observations to a general conclusion. All right. So an example of using inductive reasoning, consider the following argument. In New York City, it snowed 30 inches during January 2010 and 35 inches during January 2011. Therefore, New York City will receive at least 30 inches of snow every January. Does this argument use inductive reasoning? Well, we have two observations. We have the 2010 observation and we have the 2011 observation and we use that to go ahead and create some kind of general rule so yes it's very much inductive reasoning now is this statement going to be true well we'll find out we really don't aren't concerned too much about the truthiness of the statement we're concerned more about our reasoning involved how do we get to our rule well, we came from observations to get there. That makes it inductive reasoning. Let's look at a sequence. We use inductive sequence all the way back in elementary school and we start uh, uh, looking for patterns, um, trying to predict uh, what the next outcome might be. So it says, consider the following sequence of numbers, 1, 4, 9, 16, 25. If the number pattern continues, can you conclude what the next number will be? What about the 15th number? Well, as I look here, I've got 1 to 4 is a change of 3, 4 to 9 is a change of 5, change of 7, change of 9. 
we can see that there's a pattern here, plus 3, plus 5, plus 7, plus 9. We can predict the next one will be plus 11, right? We have this change of plus 2, um, so we would get to 36. That would be kind of an addition style way of getting there uh, to look for the next uh, number in the sequence. We could also see that these are just perfect squares. 1 squared is 1, 2 squared is 4, 3 squared, 4 squared, 5 squared. And so using the sequence or the pattern I used before, getting to that 15th number might be very difficult or at least time consuming, maybe not difficult, but it would take me some time to get there. But if I recognize that they're perfect squares, then I can just take 15 squared and say the 15th number will be 225. Okay, because I look at observations and I make some kind of rule. Here my rule would be n squared. n for what digit are we talking about in the sequence? The 15th is 15 squared. Counterexample. So this is kind of a sidestep to our inductive reasoning. But uh, consider this statement. You must have a degree in computer science to become wealthy in the computer industry. Is that a valued argument? Well, for the most part, people who are successful in the computer industry do have a background in computer science, uh, do have degrees in computer science. But a counterexample is just one example of, uh, is one example that shows that the statement is false. Okay, and a good counterexample might be Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs created Apple. Uh, did not have a computer science degree. Bill Gates, I think, falls in the same mold. Neither of these two guys, they're worth uh, billions apiece. Um, neither had computer science degrees, and they become some of the wealthiest people in the computer industry. So those would both be counterexamples. Uh, some more reasoning with sequences. So we had this sidestep into counterexamples. Look at, look at some sequences here and try to come up with, uh, we're going to see two different types of sequences, at least that we're going to classify here. So it says identify a pattern in each of the following sequences of numbers, then use the established pattern to find the next term in the sequence. So typically we start out with what's called arithmetic. And that's what I started with earlier, even though it wasn't exactly arithmetic. Typically when we look for arithmetic sequences, we examine the differences. If we can find a consistent difference, it's an arithmetic sequence. So from 4 to 9, it's a difference of plus 5. From 9 to 14, plus 5. 14 to 19, plus 5. We see that there's this consistent plus 5. So we can predict or infer that the next one would be 19 plus 5 is 24. No problem. Okay? But if we look at B, 2, 6, 18, 54, we have a plus 4, plus 12, plus 36. That's not arithmetic. There's no consistent difference there. And what we have is called a geometric sequence where we actually have some kind of ratio or some kind of multiplier. If I look here, 2 to 6 is times 3. 6 to 18 is times 3. 18 to 54 is times 3. If I took 54 times 3, I would get, let's see, 103 times 50 would be 150. 3 times 4 is 12, so 162. Okay? So that would be an example of a geometric sequence. Sometimes they're neither, and there's all types of different sequences, but different investigations, we find do find patterns that might not fall under arithmetic or geometrics. For instance, here we have 5 to 6 is plus 1. 6 to 8 is plus 2, 8 to 11 is plus 3. We see this increase as we go. We should uh, assume or infer from observation that the increase will be plus 1 from 3 to 4, and 11 plus 4 gives us 15 as the next number in the sequence. Okay, so you'll see some of that in the homework. Um, here's the two definitions, again, of arithmetic and geometric sequences. When the common difference between any two consecutive terms in a number sequence is the same, we call it arithmetic. Difference meaning subtraction. Geometric sequence, when the common ratio, which I said meant multiplier, 
Now that could be multiplying by two, by three, by four. It can also be dividing. These, we can also have sequences that shrink. We could cut numbers in half. Okay, divided by two, divided by two, divided by two. Okay, so when the common ratio between any two consecutive terms in a number sequence is the same, we call this geometric. All right, so we have inductive reasoning. We have sequences to show inductive reasoning. We have a counterexample, which is an example that disproves or goes against some statement. And the last kind of idea we're going to see in this section is called deductive reasoning. Okay, so now that we have discussed inductive reasoning, let's look at deductive. Deductive reasoning is a process that begins with commonly accepted facts and logically arrives at a specific conclusion. Now in lay terms, uh, you know, I said inductive was observation to rule. Deductive, I would say some specific rule, and then the rule is used, is carried out. Okay, so if they tell you some specific rule and then come to a conclusion, then it would be deductive. Okay, so let's look at an example of deductive. If you are a mammal, then you have lungs. How can this statement be evaluated as a deductive argument? Well, a mammal has lungs. Okay, that's something that we know. Uh, I suppose you could argue it's based on observation, but it doesn't say a person is a mammal and a person has lungs. Mammals then have lungs. There's no observations here. Okay, so there's no indication that it's inductive reasoning. It's just a statement uh, to something very specific, having lungs. So it's deductive. Okay, a few examples just out of the ebook here. I've got four of them. Let's go ahead and decide is it inductive or deductive reasoning. 15 says the sides of all squares are proportional. The three quadrilaterals shown are all squares, therefore, all their sides are proportional. It says the sides of all squares. It doesn't say the side of this square and the side of this square. There's no observations here. This is a rule. And then the rule is carried out. Therefore, it has to be deductive reasoning. If Jessica plays basketball and makes 7 out of every 12 free throws, then she should make 35 out of every 60 free throws. This 7 out of 12 free throws are observations of what she did. And then they're using these observations to make a rule that she would go 35 for 60. Observations, inductive. I have an 8 a.m. math class on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Each class day I leave for class in my car at 7.30 a.m. every day that the drive, uh, every day that the drive to campus takes 15 minutes. I arrive to class on time. Therefore, if I leave for class at 7.30 a.m. today and the drive to the campus takes 15 minutes, I will be on time. Again, these are all observations, okay? Observation, observation, observation. We're looking at inductive reasoning. My grade on the first test in quant reasoning was 85, so I will make a B in the course. This is an observation leading to a rule, again, inductive reasoning. Okay, um, feel free to email me uh, or ask me any questions you might have.